Wow, praise the Lord family. I'm glad to be here this uh, evening just to have this moment of sharing God's word with you and fellowship with you. And just encourage each one of us to continually and consistently hold on to our faith in God. I want to take a few minutes and share something that I believe God has put in my heart which is for our own encouragement, for our own good. Because I believe that God has a purpose and a plan for us in this time. And as we go through this fellowship together this uh, morning, I know that at the bottom of my heart, I have this inner conviction and persuasion that God is going to deposit something in your spirit that you can hold on to and that you can walk with. So blessed be the name of the Lord. Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you and we thank you for giving us the privilege and the opportunity of being your sons. Thank you that we are called by your name and we can gather together in this manner in our homes and listen to you, to your voice, come together share your word, break bread together, hear your voice, and get wisdom and counsel by which to live. I pray this uh, morning, Father, as we share God's word, that you will speak to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us. We invite the Lordship of the Son. We invite the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, even through our sharing for your own glory. We do thank you, Father, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to us about perilous times. Perilous or perilous times because I believe this is what God would prepare us about. Some few years ago uh, in Nyeri, the Lord said to me, I want you to prepare people for the day of adversity. Back then, I never really understood what it meant, although I knew it must be that a day is coming when the faith of many will be put to test. Only that I did not know it would be that soon. And here we are, brothers and sisters, the day of adversity, the day of challenge, the day of difficult, the day of hardship. This is the day that we find ourselves in. And the Lord said, I prepare the people for this day. One of the ways I believe in preparing, one of the things that God put in my heart was a question of identity. Because you cannot withstand the test and the pressures of time if you don't know who you are and if you don't know who you believe in. And that's why for me, the whole uh, uh, subject of identity and sonship is so big. So the Lord began to open my eyes to see so much about sonship. The Lord began to open my eyes to see a lot about his fathering, fatherhood of God himself. And I think I took some time to teach on uh, uh, the fatherhood of God and uh, the whole structure of the father-son wineskin. Because if we don't build according to God's design, then we are not ready for the day of adversity. The Bible says that two men build, one build on the sand. And then build on the rock. One who build on the rock is the man who heard what God was saying, the word of the Lord, and obeyed that word. So in obeying the word of God, he was building according to divine design. And his building withstood the pressure and the test of time. Beloved, the other man had the same word, but he never obeyed the word, but went on building, which means what he was building was inconsistent to the divine design, was not compliant to divine design. And so because it was not compliant to divine design, when the test came, the pressure came, the Bible says the winds blew, the rains fell, and the house fell, and great was the fall. The same test for both houses. One stood the test of time, the other one fell. The difference was that for one man, he obeyed the word. For the other, he did not. So every time we hear God's word, God is giving us a pattern, the design to build. 
One of these designs is the father-son wineskin. If we don't embrace this wineskin, we're going to miss out on the grace that God is releasing. Grace that we so desperately need in this day and time to build and withstand the test of time. So I want to encourage us not to resist God's word and to build consistent, compliant to divine design. We are living in very difficult times with a lot of anxiety and uncertainty. I believe uh, before this, you've gone through Second Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 1 to 7, and seen the story of it. Verse 1 says, But this know that in the last days perilous times will come. The word perilous, which is kalepos in Greek, means dangerous, reducing strength, fierce, hard to approach, hard to bear, troublesome, harsh. You know, very interesting word there, kalepos, means reducing strength. So we are living in days where the pressure of the day, the test of the day, the battles of the day, the difficulties of the day are literally draining strength from us. And you can see what is happening right now in the government. You can see what is happening right now, not just in Kenya, but world over. Men look beaten. Men look worn out, drained. The pressure, the fierceness of the virus that is, has invaded the earth is such that it is reducing, it's sapping strength out of us, literally, such that people don't know what to do. This thing evoke fear in the environment. Things that are harsh and troublesome and fierce. Some versions say stressing times, times of stress. These things evoke fear in the environment. And you agree with me, there's a lot of fear right now in the atmosphere. And I know even some of you I speak to right now are struggling with fear. You're not sure how it will be tomorrow. What if I lost my job? How will I live now? What will become of me? What, what about my children? My tomorrow? What will be? Jobs, people are losing jobs. What happens? Do you remember, beloved, when the Lord said to me, and I think I, I spoke it to you, when the Lord said to me sometimes last year, said, mobilize your people to pray for their faith, for their family, for their health, and for their vocations. Well, some of us took it very personally, seriously. Others took it lightly. But here we are now. If you, if, if you prayed and believed God about your life, your health, your family, your vocation, then you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Because God will keep you. Times are difficult. These are times of great fear and anxiety. They are rough times that are literally sapping strength out of many. If you look at the word pillarus in the you know, English dictionary, it means to be exposed to imminent risk of disaster or ruin. And such are the times we are in today, perilous times. We are exposed to imminent danger of disaster. We are exposed to imminent risk of disaster or ruin. Why is everybody at home right now? Why is there a lockdown in many nations? Why are we debating about whether there should be a, a total lockdown in Kenya or not? Because everyone, everyone is feeling exposed at the risk of a disaster. And indeed, it is so. So we find ourselves in such a situation. The children of Israel, who and, and we need to keep studying these children of Israel because it's an example, it's a picture of the church. The children of Israel found themselves in a similar situation before where they were exposed to, you know, they found themselves in a similar situation before where they were exposed to imminent risk of national disaster and death. They were in that situation. And the risk was a national disaster. 
and death. Very interesting here. You can pick up the story in Numbers chapter 21. Pick it up from verse 1 and you can go there to uh, maybe verse 10, 11. But I want to read from verse 5. Numbers 21, verse 5 through to 9. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our soul loads this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they beat the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may, that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is beaten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had beaten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. What was the problem here? Let me highlight a few things to us. The children of Israel dishonored God and dishonored his representative to them. They questioned God's wisdom and they questioned God's leadership over their lives. They resisted authority. They questioned by speaking against God and against Moses, dishonoring God and dishonoring God's representative. What are they doing? They are questioning God's wisdom. Yeah. Why have you brought us out of Egypt? To die in the wilderness. That's questioning God's wisdom. Secondly, they despised the one God gave to lead them. They questioned God's wisdom and leadership. They despised the one God gave to lead them. Thirdly, they preferred the position God had taken them or had taken them from over where he had brought them to. In other words, they preferred where they were to where they were they are now. In other words, where we were, we were better than where we are right now. Sometimes you feel like, you know? So they preferred the position God had taken them from. They preferred their past over their present. Yeah. So they preferred their past over their present. Alright? Fourthly, they despised and hated God's providence to them. He said, we loathe this worthless bread. God's bread, the word that God gave them, the sustenance, divine sustenance, manna that God gave them, they call it worthless. And sometimes we are like that. We don't say it's worthless, but we despise God's word to us so very much. And then with all these, they resisted God's design for their life. They did not want to live the way God wanted them to live. They wanted to live a certain way. What was God's response to this kind of rebellion, kind of resistance, kind of dishonor? What was God's response? God responded to them in anger and sent fiery serpents. Then suddenly they had perilous times. Suddenly times were difficult. Times were hard. Times were fierce. Suddenly times were troublesome and dangerous. They are now exposed to imminent risk of a national disaster and death. Now they live in fear. This thing can bite anyone any moment. There are serpents all over. Anyone can be beaten any minute. When you're beaten, you die. Isn't that how we are living today? You're so anxious, so cautious. Let me tell you, it's amazing that even children of God right now are driven more by fear than faith. Because of the fear of the coronavirus, you can't forget to sanitize. You can't forget to wash. You're so cautious of who. You're so cautious of the environment suddenly. You're so cautious of the uncleanliness around. You're so cautious. And not, not, not cautious rather. So conscious of the environment around. So conscious of the dirt around. So conscious of the uncleanliness. So conscious of bacteria. Have you touched something and you suddenly feel like, what? You know? 
Things you always touched and never got bothered, now you are bothered. Then what do you do? Of course, we have faith in the, in the, in the sanitizers. We do, we do. Yeah, we have faith. Those of you parents who are harassing and quarreling them, they should sanitize, wash hands. That's not bad. That's good. It's a good discipline. You know, a few hours ago, I had a visitor who came to visit me and he told me, um, if, if we got used, he told me personally, if I got used to that behavior of sanitizing myself, uh, I would actually realize that I don't have colds and flus. Easy homa homa. He says because it, you, you eliminate too many bacteria and viruses, you know, that are all around. So it's a good behavior. But what is driving us? It's not really that we want cleanliness. It's fear. It's fear. Let's, uh, it's fear, beloved. It's fear. That's where these people are. Now they fear. I will be beaten. Anyone can be beaten. We will die. Death was imminent. And I think that's what many people are thinking. Thinking death. What was the response of the people when these times came? The people turned to the very authority they had despised. They turned to Moses. Friend, do not despise or resist authority. This is God's design for your life. Never resist authority. At every level, do not resist authority. And I want to speak to those of you who are, you know, you know in my household of faith. Do not resist authority. I believe, I believe in authority. I believe in being under authority. I function and serve under authority. I serve under authority. I'm a man under authority. I believe in authority. I believe in authority. I believe that God works through the principle of delegated authority. Never resist. Don't despise authority. Don't despise authority. God does not tell you to... Uh, uh, and does not give you the, does not promise you that uh, the one who is leading you will always do things the way you want them done. No, no. God simply tells you to submit yourself to authority. Don't resist or despise authority. Why? It is God's design for your life. God has designed for you to be under authority at any given time. Do not despise that. Suddenly, they realize it was a mistake. So now they are going back to Moses, the one they despise. They're going back to Moses. Let me tell you, beloved, don't despise the one that God has set over you. Don't despise. I mean, I have many people that I work with, I have many friends, I have many men, many leaders. But listen, those are not the people that God has given me primarily to submit to. That's why I recognize my spiritual father as a leader, as an authority. And yet, from that position of recognizing him, now I recognize every other man who, who speaks God's voice, carries God's grace, and God has positioned them over my life. And I have quite a number of them who function in authority over me, and I respect such men. So authority is everywhere. Now they go back to Moses. They suddenly realize we have to be under authority. That's the first thing they did. Good thing they did. Be under authority. You want to navigate through the times of perilous and difficult moments be under authority. Secondly, they acknowledged their need for divine intervention in their life. Now they say to Moses, pray for us. When they go to Moses, they recognize his authority. Now they secondly, they say, pray for us. Friends, never lose focus of God's place in your life and your need for him. Praise the Lord. Never lose focus. Of God's place in your life. What is the place of God in your life? Never lose focus of that. He is sovereign. He's supreme. He's 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 at the top. He's he's not secondary. He's not an afterthought. Never lose focus of God's place in your life. God has His place in your life, but you must be conscious of that. Never lose focus of God's place in your life, and never lose focus of your need. For him, I need him, you need him, we need him. Isn't it amazing how, how that this small virus has so subdued the nations of the world that everyone is now remembering there is a God. But you know what? We are doing it the other way around. They did it the right way. 
they first turned recognized authority, then they now ask the authority to intercede for them. Never lose focus of God's place in your life. Sehemu ya mungu maishani mwako. Nafasi ya mahali pa mungu maishani. What is God's place in your life? It's got to be the primary place. I need him most. That was the response of the people. What was God's answer? When Moses prayed for the people, the Lord said to him, Make a fiery serpent which was to be made of bolo. <laughs> Bro, sorry. He says, Make a fiery furnace. I mean, a fiery serpent. Now, the serpent was to be made of bronze. What is symbol? What does this symbolize? Serpent is symbolic of evil, dishonesty, cunningness, craftiness, symbolic of sin. Satan is sin. All right? Bronze is a symbol of humanity, the weakness of humanity. You remember the Bible talks about gold and silver and bronze. Bronze is the inferior, is the inferior uh, material. So it's, it's man's weakness. Okay, the, uh, the unregenerated man, unredeemed man. That's, that's, that's a uh, bronze. Bronze is also symbolic of judgment. judgment. So keep that at the back of your mind. We're coming back there soon. The second thing God said is, set that serpent on a pole. The pole was symbolic of the cross, which is itself a symbol of death. The cross is a symbol of death and life. So the pole was symbolic of the cross, which, uh, uh, and that cross is a symbol of death. The serpent, therefore, on the pole was a picture of Jesus, the redeemed man, who took all our sins and death sentence on the cross. Remember, remember, when one was beaten by the serpent, now that means that's a death sentence. Because once you're beaten, you die. Death sentence. But now God says, put the pole, put the serpent on the pole. Who, once one is beaten, they look at the bronze serpent, then they shall live. Why? Because their death is taken by that on the cross. So they release death on the cross and they have life from the cross. So the one on the cross dies that the other one may live. There, listen brothers and sisters, at the cross of Jesus, there the great exchange happened. Hallelujah. He took our sins and death. We took his life and righteousness. Now in him, we are righteous. Now in him, we have life. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful? Now they couldn't die. God had given them the antidote of the, the serpent's bite. Now they had an answer to the perilous times. Now they had a solution to the difficult and hard times. The harsh times suddenly were dealt with a death blow by an answer from God. May the Lord answer us in this day and time in the name of Jesus. May the Lord answer us. May the Lord answer us. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to talk about the application on this as we begin to conclude. As it was then, so it is now, beloved. The way to navigate life during perilous time is to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, whose life is our salvation. We have to keep our eyes fixed on him. When we are beaten, we look at him. When we look at him, we have life. Hear the words of the master himself. John 3, 14 to 15. He says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The moment you looked up to him, you believed in him, death was taken out of you, he took your death, he gave you his life. Now you have eternal life. Hallelujah. Now you have eternal life. This life is undiable. This life is eternal. It's immortal. This life can, can subdue corona. This life. 
that we have at work in us is a life that quickens our mortal bodies. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 to 11 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to go through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, we have an antidote. That is Christ himself. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I wish you can look at the person next to you and tell them, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. It's a very simple thing to say, but it's an internal thing. It's a mental, it's a spiritual thing. Your mind has to be fixed on him. In all things, your mind constantly fixed on him. That there is noise about corona all over, but your mind is fixed on him. Bible says that you keep your mind stayed on him. I think that should be Isaiah 3 10. He, he keeps him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Fix your mind. Stay. Set your mind on things above. Don't be too scared and so conscious about the environment. Looking unto Jesus. Let me tell you, I will die when he says I will die. Period. That's it. That's settled in me. I mean, I've been, I have been close to death many times. I've seen it. I've sensed it. I've felt it. The closest was last year. But you know what? When my eyes are fixed on him, death is subdued. My spiritual father has been praying since sometimes last year that in his family there will be no premature deaths. That's my inheritance. And what is in my inheritance? It's your inheritance. No premature death. No premature death. The other day I had uh, our father, Thamo, just speaking and saying how he's praying and trusting God that none in his household will be caught up with this virus. And I said, I think I am part of that household and therefore it cannot. My eyes are on Jesus. My eyes are on Jesus. So let me say two things on how to respond to this. Number one, do not be distracted from the Lord by the challenges of the moment. That's how you go through perilous times. Do not be distracted from the Lord by the challenges of the moment. May your faith in God not fail. Amen. May your faith not fail. So the things I speak and my heart begins to burn within me. May your faith not fail. Hold on to God, your Father. Believe Him. Amen. Believe His Word as the only source of true and reliable information. There's too much information going on in the social media, you know, and the electronic media, in all forms of media. There's all sorts of information. But listen. Listen, believe that God's word is the only source of true information and continue steadfastly in the things you have learned from the Lord. Amen. I dare say to you, beloved, continue steadfastly in the things that you have learned from me in, in Christ and from many others who have taught you in the Lord. That is the Apostles' Doctrine. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 to 17 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly 
in Christ. Let me take that again. Yes. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's what is happening right now. Many are deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise. The word is able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So hold on to those things. Hold on to those things. Continue in the things which you have learned. Time fills me to begin uh, investigating the word continue there and you see which has got to do with abiding and staying and remaining within that walking within it, the things that you have learned. So keep to them. The notes you wrote, it's time to go back and read them. The message is all in your phone. It's time to go back and listen. Begin to listen. The faith comes by hearing. Listen to the word more. Don't just sit and read. Listen, 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 listen. Listen more. It's time now to listen and read. And begin to recollect the things you've heard and begin to walk in them. Secondly, I said, this is how you respond to these perilous times. Say, number one, do not be distracted from the Lord by the challenges of the moment. And second, number two, stay in the family and behave like a son of God. Amen. Stay in the family and behave like a son of God. That's how you live. That's how you remain strong and enjoy divine covering and immunity. Next week, God willing, uh, I'll, I'll do, or maybe on Tuesday, I hope so. I can do a post on Goshen. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters. Stay in the family. Stay connected. Remain connected. Stay in the family. Remain connected to the Father that God has given you and to the brothers that God has given you. Stay in the family and behave like a son of God. That's who you are. Don't just say it. Don't just speak it. Behave it. Believe it and leave it. Believe it and leave it. Believe it and leave it. Amen. Believe it and leave it. And I finish by reading to you, by reading Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 to 39. Therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the judge shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Verse 39, powerful things he says, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe the saving of the soul. Hallelujah. Do me a favor. Look at someone tell them, we are not of those. We are not of those. Now tell them again, but of those. Hey, we are not of those, but of those. We are not of those who draw back. We are not giving up. We are those who believe to the saving of the soul. Keep holding on to your faith in God. Keep your eyes fixed on Him. Keep your mind stayed on Him. Keep your heart locked up in Him. Lock up your faith in Him. We are not of those who draw back, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We believe to the very end, until our soul experiences the salvation of God. Keep on believing. Keep on holding to God. Lay hold of Him. Hold on to Him. That's how you go through these times. And may the grace of the Lord be with you. And so, Father, I thank you today. The entrance of your heart brings faith. The entrance of it brings light. The entrance of your word builds. The entrance of your word strengthens. And in the name of Jesus, I release strength in every spirit right now. I release strength to you. I release grace to you. I release peace to you. I release comfort. I, I take hold of peace from our Heavenly Father. And I release it to you now. 
in the name of Jesus. I release grace to you in the name of Jesus. And I bless you. I bless you. May the hand of the Lord keep you. The Lord preserve you. And the Lord preserve all that concerns you. The Lord perfect all that concerns you. May the hand of the Lord keep you and preserve you. May the hand of the Lord preserve your life, your health, your family, and your vocation. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, have a lovely day. We'll keep giving you more of this. But prefer hopefully on Tuesday. Till then, the grace of the Lord be with you. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you in every way. Peace and grace to you, beloved.